All right. Hello, 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 hello. Live on Instagram and on Facebook. And I'm just going to share this chat also in our Facebook group. So no one misses out. How are you doing today? If you're joining today, leave a comment in the, in the comment section. So I know who's here, what you're up to, how you're feeling. And I can't really see who is joining us on Instagram, but I will check in with you regularly during our chat today. So we're speaking about common mistakes yoga teachers make. Have you got any idea? Have you got any idea what these are? Common mistakes yoga teachers make. Let me just copy this in our Facebook group too. There we go. Just check in, no comments here, okay. Perfect, we're all set up. Like I said, online, uh, online, live on Facebook, in our group, on our page, and here on Instagram. Instagram, <laughs> And I'm really excited about our chat today because this is something that we speak a lot about in our Facebook group, but also during the challenge last week, and something that we are working on during our workshop series, which is starting next week. In this workshop series, we're going to work with yoga teachers that are looking to improve their yoga teaching skills in English, learn how to cue, how to write a sequence that's effective, how to theme these sequences or yoga classes, but also how to structure your own offerings like a workshop, a class schedule or a ritual in English. But today, speaking about five common mistakes, I already asked, anyone know what five, what common mistakes yoga teachers make? And if you're watching, let us know in the comments so I can see who is here. All right. And I'm, excuse me, I can't see your comments on Instagram coming in. I have to look over a couple of times because my laptop is right in front. All right. Mm -hmm. All good. So let's first speak about mistakes, because as you know, we can only learn and improve from making mistakes. We need to have experience making mistakes to actually become better as a skill, whether you're a yoga teacher or learning any skill. Mistakes are necessary. And to be honest with you, I really think that mistakes are the best way to learn. Because only this way you know when you're doing something wrong or when something can be improved or developed better. So this chat, we're not only going to speak about mistakes, but also analyze them, what they are good for, and speak about techniques on how to overcome them, how to prevent them, and how to use language that's more accurate and effective in your yoga classes. The mistakes I'm going to speak about are mistakes I have made myself, and I see many yoga teachers uh, make all the time, even if they are very experienced. So it doesn't really matter how much experience you have. But I do think that with self-practice, analyzing the, these mistakes, working on these mistakes or fixing these mistakes, we can become more compassionate and more effective effective yoga teachers. As I said at the start already, in our workshop series that starts next week, we're going to speak about these and learn more about these and go into way more depth. But today I want to create awareness about, around these mistakes, analyze these mistakes, and maybe even start thinking for yourself or maybe watch videos of yourself teaching to see if you do these things too. All right, so what really is a mistake? In yoga, 
it's very difficult to say what really is a mistake or what is maybe preference or a style or maybe your education. There are so many different lineages and there are different beliefs. There are mixed combinations of styles and it's really difficult to say this is right and that is wrong. With anything in life, really, we can't say this is completely wrong or this is completely right. Because we only know as much as we have learned until now, how much we have experienced until now. And well, it depends on many, many different things, which I'm going to get to after this, going going to get there soon. I also want to point out that mistakes are not always what we think they are. As I said already, most even the most experienced yoga teachers still make mistakes and we keep learning every day. Every day there's new things. There's new inventions, there's new research. There are um, other teachers that have found out something new that maybe in the past, this was the, the way to do it. And right now, this you can't do it. <laughs> you can't do it this way anymore. Sometimes it's maybe inaccurate or it's non-inclusive or research has proven that this is actually very damaging. So there's different ways to actually look at these mistakes and not even to criticize yourself, but also feel for yourself if this is a mistake in your, um, in your experience. We can't know everything and we can't know what we didn't know um, now we know things that we didn't know 20 years ago and next week we will things, know things that we don't know right now. Yesterday I spoke to my yoga teacher and he's been teaching for nearly 30 years and he said that, you know, five years ago I was doing things that were the way to teach. This is the way to do things. This is the way to explain and be effective, be compassionate. But then we're caught out on it and, and told them five years later, actually, this is not as good as we thought. We need to change this again. So this all goes back to that there are new, in new inventions and new re research all the time, that things become outdated and we have to be or we have to take the responsibility, responsibility to stay informed and educate ourselves. This is one of the reasons that after our first yoga teacher training, whether it's a 200 training or you're doing a 500 training uh, in one go, that it doesn't stop there. We need to stay informed and keep ourselves educated. That's the reason we have um, continuing education or continuing development. I also want to point out three factors that could play a role when we make a mistake because there are many different things that are going on in the life of a yoga teacher. So these could be external factors, such as the time of the day, the time of the year, um, change of the weather, things that have an impact on our well-being or our immune system, our hormones. There are internal factors, such as relationships and feelings, uh, emotions that come with these relationships. And teachers, we shouldn't forget that teachers also have lives outside the yoga classroom. You know, sometimes life really gets in the way and can be very distracting. And we are very easy or very quick to criticize someone for the way that they are presenting themselves. I do believe that with regular self-practice and a lot of self-knowledge, a lot of uh, self-study, we can learn how to detach ourselves from external and internal uh, things that are distracting for us or that can stop us in our yoga practice. But it's, we have to remember that this is not always possible and be very, very forgiving with this, accepting with this, allowing this, that this, allowing ourselves as yoga teachers to make these mistakes when things are not going great, but also allow your teachers to make these mistakes. Then there are educational factors. Like I said, there's so many different styles of yoga, so many different types, there's different schools, and we should be really open-minded to not disapprove too quickly. 
if you come from an Ashtanga background, it might be that you don't agree with the things that are being taught in a Hatha or Vinyasa type of school or training and the other way around. So someone might be studying a particular thing and just goes with the knowledge that they have gained in their training from their teachers and another person have tra has trained with another per with another trainer and goes with those with that knowledge with that training it doesn't mean that one is bad or one is uh, amazing it doesn't mean that one is right and the other one is wrong it's just different takes on it different types of education different beliefs and different styles we shouldn't forget there's different styles um a good example of this as well, when we speak about an educational factor that could be seen as a mistake. When we are going through educational programs and we criticize someone or make a mistake, for example, someone might be studying or really getting into restorative yoga. They are teaching a vinyasa class or a hatha class and they are using more props than they normally would. This doesn't mean, first of all, that you, you need to use those props. They are there for um, if you like to use them. But it might well be that your teacher is actually trying to train themselves using these different techniques. So this is a way for the teacher to apply all their new knowledge in different types of styles or teachings, but also gives you an opportunity to experience new things rather than judging them because they are using props. It's not the way I've been taught. This is not what we're meant to do. And this is a mistake. This is bad. It really is a big thing to criticize. We need to be very understanding with internal factors, external factors, educational factors. And this list, this list can go on. I've got so many things I could say more about this, but I want to get to the mistakes of today. So my point is really that as a yogi or yoga practitioner, you can't really criticize your teacher for doing things wrong, first of all. Neither is this an invitation as a yoga teacher to criticize yourself or other yoga teachers. We have to be very understanding of different styles, all the internal factors, emotional factors, things that are going on in life, but also accept where the teacher is in this present moment. A teacher might be very new and still exploring things. A teacher might be very experienced and not be informed about new, in, 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 um, <laughs> new research. And a teacher uh, might be coming from a different background. So really, really take these things into account when you criticize someone. And this goes for everything in life, not only yoga teachers anything in life, anytime you feel like you have to criticize someone. So this chat is not to criticize, it's only to create awareness and analyze. If you're a yoga teacher, analyze your teaching style and maybe improve the things that could be better or more effective. All right, so as mentioned, all of these things that we're going to speak about, the mistakes, but also teaching training, continuing education, on continue, continuing personal and professional development are things that we're going to speak about in our workshop series starting next week. If you're interested in this, you can have a look at uh, the link in my bio on Instagram, and I will later link, on, link to it on Facebook as well. Um, but just so you know that this is an introduction of things that we we will speak about in the future here on, on Instagram and on Facebook and on the podcast, but also give you an idea of what is going to be included. So I've explained everything about mistakes and how to look at them, how to not criticize people. Today, I want to point out five very common mistakes that are very practical, practical mistakes that we make in our yoga classes. And with practical mistakes, I mean things that you might be able to improve in your teaching style. When you're teaching a group, online, offline, in person, whoever you're teaching, things that you say in your yoga class. All right. Starting with number one. 
and I need to drink some water because I'm speaking a lot. <laughs> one second. Number one, using passive language. So for those that are studying or have studied English before, you know that the passive in English is formed by the verb to be and the past participle. For example, the book was put on the table or the book has been put on the table. They explain an action that was done to an object. The action has been performed by who, we don't know necessarily, to an object. In yoga, in your classes, this could sound or look like coming to ego pose, the right leg is hooked or tucked or twisted under the left leg. Or standing in Tadasana, the arms are lifted up to the ceiling. In the second example, uh, there are two problems because it's all, it also includes the ING. This is something we really want to stay away for, from if you're not giving supporting cues. Supporting cues are instructions or words, phrases that we use while we are staying in a certain asana. But if we are actually giving cues to have students perform an action, we want to make these actions or these phrases, instructions, actionable. So in our, in our 10 tips for multilingual yoga teachers, we actually spoke about ING and using non-continuous or state verbs in our classes. If you are interested in the 10 tips for multilingual yoga teachers, you can go to engaunite.com slash 10 tips for multilingual yoga teachers. And the 10 is literally one zero. Um, but today I want to focus on the passive. The problem with the passive is that it, it ignores the big fat fact of the aim or the focus of a yoga class. A really big fat fact of the yoga class. Because why we are in a yoga class is to become present to gain more presence or to be in the present moment. Passive language isn't present. P passive language makes it more complex, but it also takes away the, um, the focus on the action because the arms are lifted or the, the leg is tucked under the, the right leg is tucked under the left. There is no action. There is no action to perform for your students. So, Instead of using passive language, we want to use simple, direct, open, and actionable language. So, cross your left leg over your right, ego pose, or stay in Tadasana, lift your arms up to the ceiling, or lift your arms next to your ears. These things are actionable, direct, and simple everyone will understand what's happening or what needs to be done, All right? So that was number one, passive language. Just checking in with your comments here. See, there's a comment here on coming in on Facebook, amazing. Thank you for joining everyone. If you have questions about anything, please let me know because I can try and include it. Thank you, so Tswana, I'm always trying to pronounce your name right. Thank you. All right, we're going to continue. So that was all about the passive, wanting, it to, make, wanting to make it direct and actionable. Another common mistake is saying, look at me like this or like that or like so. The problem with these things, these three things or these three ways of asking someone to look at you is that you're asking someone to look at you. It's really challenging sometimes to describe how a certain action should be or needs to be performed. I understand this. I've been there too. It really is challenging sometimes because this language is not really the type of language we use in our day to day. However, asking people to look at you takes away from 
doing something or being in the, sorry, it takes away from being in the present moment, from being in their experience on their mat, from feeling into the body, and it really disrupts concentration. So look at me or look at this, look at that, or like this, like that, like so, are very, very, um, not damaging necessarily, but it just takes away from the present moment and the, the students or the practitioners attention on their practice. So a fun fact, which is actually not fun at all, but I think it's a really important thing to note is that recently due to the fact that we are all practicing online more than ever, um, a lot of people actually got themselves hurt because they had to look at their Zoom screen or their, their laptop or phone screen too much. They're performing their asanas or in their practice and had to bend their neck all the way or turn their head all the way to the screen and actually hurt their neck. Um, so in other words, asking your students to look at you can actually lead to injuries as well. Instead, learn effective cues that people understand straight away so that they can follow you even when you're just leading them with uh, an audio track or with audio in general maybe video is not available they can't actually see you or they can't uh, turn on their cameras and you can't see them it's really important that we can give effective cues so they don't know what to do in the moment without having to look at you. Okay, so number one, number number one, passive language. Number two, non sorry, non <laughs> non number two. Look at me. Look at this or look at that or like so. Make it very actionable and make it very effective, so people understand without having to look at you. Number three. Number three, mistake number three, non-inclusive language. This is a big one, a very, very big one. And it's very challenging because just as education, this is one thing that constantly evolves, constantly changes. And um, it's something that we stay, need to really stay informed about or informed on. In our language training with Marta last week, we spoke about this as well. The episode is now online on our podcast, so you can listen to it. I think it's called um, Ineffective, no, Outdated Cues and Complex Grammar. We speak about inclusive and non-inclusive language. But today I want to point out three things. First of all, this one is obvious, but speaking about people or speaking to people about the way they look. So this could be either gender, it could be a body type, it could be their hair color or a hair structure, it could be texture, <laughs> it could be um, what they are wearing, it could be many different things. But try to not address people by the way they look. And I think this is especially for um, when we speak about skin tone and uh, gender, skin tone and gender are big ones, big ones. Stay away from calling people out by the way they look. Simply address everyone as a whole, as a collective, or just don't address them this way. <laughs> um, then speaking about levels. We see on schedules very often beginners, intermediates or advanced. This assumes that maybe a person that hasn't got certain abilities or experiences can't go to a class that is for intermediate or advanced students, which is not necessarily true. I'm going to give you a very personal example. I am very, very weak, very, very weak in my upper arms and my shoulders. I find it very challenging to do a chaturanga. And for that reason, I could go to a beginner class to gain more strength. And that's, that would be my personal choice. But it doesn't mean that I can't go to an intermediate class or an advanced class because there are other things that I can do due to other experiences. It also downgrades people that have certain disabilities 
or certain uh, injuries that they are recovering from. So speaking to people and, and pointing out their level at some st stage is really damaging and can be very emotionally uh, damaging. The other thing, and especially when you're teaching, is, is saying, if you need to, if you need to do something. This also points out that they are not at a level or don't have enough experience yet to do something specifically. Instead of if you need to, simply replace it by if you want to. People that need to do something for whatever reason, they need to put their knee down or they need to keep their arms in front of their shoulders. They will do that if you give them the option if they want, if you want to. Remember that yoga is very, very sensitive and we're dealing with very personal, a very personal experience, but also with egos. There's a lot of ego in the yoga class. So give people the option of variations instead of modifications. Give people the option of if you want to, rather than if you need to. Another thing when we speak about inclusive or non-inclusive language is praising people in your classes. Praising people in your classes. This could look like something, oh, that's a great thing. You're so strong, Alicia. Or look at you, you've grown so much. Daryl, whatever, whoever this person is, but not giving attention to any other people in your class. This can be so damaging because it means that you're neglecting other students in your classes. They might feel as if they are not good enough or not doing it right or not doing it the way that um, you would like to see it. And it's just not inclusive. If you would like to praise students either Praise the student or the class as a whole by complimenting the class as a whole. Or if you have enough time and you know everyone's name and you've got this type of relationship with your students, praise everyone because every person will do something right in your, in your class. Praise everyone singularly if that's what you want to do. But don't, point, don't praise people singularly, singularly are only one person at a time. It can be very non-inclusive. Okay. Mistake number four. Mistake number four. Making the class all about the teacher. This is not to criticize at all, but see if you can recognize yourself in any of the following questions. And I need to read these because I, I, I wrote a lot of questions, um, but here we go. Who are you teaching? Are you teaching yourself or your students? What does teaching mean? Does it mean that you're showing how good you are at something? How much knowledge you have about something? Does it, does it mean that you need to prove how much knowledge and experience you have or that you have got what it takes to teach yoga? Or is your class about the student? listening to their needs, their desires, their personal stories? Is it about serving your students and meeting them where they are at right now and create and design an experience that serves them so that they can explore their body, their mind for themselves. They can explore their own yoga journey. When I speak about making the class all about the teacher, this is not because they are egocentric, but very often teachers are worried about how they come across. If they know the right words, if they're doing the asanas right, if everyone likes them enough to come back to the next class, if, um, if they're doing whatever the, the students want from them and how they look at them, if they're looking right, if they're doing the asanas in the most amazing way. And this actually really makes you self-absorbed. It makes you feel or think a lot about the way that you present yourself. Again, this is not egocentric, but very often an insecurity or coming from limiting beliefs. So if you feel that if you're going to your class and you're really busy about thinking about 
you're really busy thinking about how you come across or how people see you or how people perceive you, try to try to change the story. Try, try to change it around. Turn the story uh, towards your students. A few things that you can do when you find yourself in a situation like this. And I, I, I think I mentioned at the start, all of these things I have done myself too, and it, they are very common. So don't criticize yourself if you feel, if you recognize yourself this way, but really see it as an opportunity to analyze your teaching style, your teaching skills and learn from these things. So things that you can do to turn around the story so instead we look at ourselves or are very busy thinking of how we come across, focus on your students. Arrive to your class 15, 15 minutes early, move your body, revise your sequence, get your playlist ready, make sure it's not a shovel. <laughs> um, greet your students, ask them how they are doing, ask them about, um, what's going on in their lives, how they are feeling in this moment. And think about what they need from you right now. How can you serve them? What is something that you need when you go to a yoga class or you need it when you were a beginner or starting yoga? What is something that you can offer to your students right now? Maybe you can think of a quote or an affirmation, something that has helped you a lot in the past, or maybe even yesterday, and that you can now share with them. This doesn't take away the focus on you, but it also will help you to lead more compassionate classes. All right. I see that on Instagram, we, we got frozen. So I'm just going to reconnect. Oh no. I lost people on Instagram. Sorry. Seems like there's no connection. I will get back there later. Uh, 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 uh. one second for those that are watching do you recognize yourself in any of these things let me know in the comments let me know in the comments and if you're watching as well doesn't does it make sense okay anything Give me one second. I think something went wrong here. Maybe my phone got too hot. All right, well, I'm going to continue here. We can get back on Instagram, amazing. Otherwise we'll just post it later, post it later there. Okay. So number one was passive language. Number two, look at me or look at that. Uh, non-inclusive language, number three, making the class all about the teacher. And the last one, apologizing too much. Apologizing is a big, big, big thing. Um, so a lot of teachers apolog apologize when they do something wrong. For example, mixing up left and right, mixing up directions, uh, maybe forgetting words, forgetting cues, forgetting the name of an asana. Sometimes people leave out the left or the right side in a vinyasa class, for example. Um, but I want you to remember, it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to forget something. It really is okay to mess up sometimes. You're human after all, it's definitely okay. In none of these cases of the examples I mentioned, so forgetting a cue, forgetting an asana name, or forgetting something in general, or simply making a mistake, mixing up left and right, no one got hurt, no one got damaged, no one got bullied or ignored. These are things that happen. We don't have to apologize for them. So please stop saying, I'm sorry. Stop saying, I'm sorry. 
if you want to apologize, use excuse me. Excuse me is a really nice way to acknowledge your mistake, but also carry on. Don't make it a big deal. Saying I'm sorry can mean that you did something terrible. You did something that was really damaging or that completely messed up the sequence. It completely messed up their experience. It can also mean that your students think less of you or they think that you don't know what you're doing or they think that you're, you've got very little experience and maybe this, this person doesn't really know um, how to teach yet which is not true, which is not true at all. Everyone is worthy of teaching yoga and it takes time and practice. And with time and practice, also with self-practice, you will make less mistakes. But if you do make mistakes, I make mistakes, my teachers make mistakes, everyone I know makes mistakes, so why can't you? So if you do make mistakes, simply excuse yourself and move on. You can laugh, you can make a joke about it, but carry on. The world didn't end there. Also important, if you made a mistake and someone got offended or hurt, um, it was very serious. In this case, we have to apologize. We have to apologize from the heart and just be, really be sincere about it. There's nothing worse than actually causing damage, whether it's physically or emotionally, and not apologizing for that. But these things don't happen very often, I believe. And in the case that I'm speaking about, mistakes that we make in our queuing are not really things you need to apologize for. So say, excuse me instead, laugh and move on. Okay, many things we mentioned today, many things that came up in, that, in this chat today. How are you feeling? Those are on Facebook. Just let me see if I can see any comments coming in here. Mm -hmm. No, I don't see anything here yet. If you have questions, anyone, if you have questions, send me a private message or send a comment here below. Tomorrow, I will be back with our weekly q and We've got a weekly Q&A to answer questions about anything related to teaching yoga, learning yoga vocabulary, learning yoga cues, anything that has to do with it. So please send them in to, and I can send and I can answer them tomorrow. Um, and also, if you like this topic and you would like to improve your teaching styles, your teaching style and your teaching skills, your teaching techniques, our workshop series starts next week. And until Saturday, we have a 25% discount. So on this workshop series, you will learn how to cue more effectively you will get cue formulas and techniques to make your cues more uh, direct, simpler and easier to digest so people don't have to look at you anymore. <laughs> um, you will learn how to theme a class and how to find inspiration around you that you can use for your classes. You will learn how to sequence effectively and confidently because a lot of teaching practices as well. And you will learn how to structure your own, your own offerings. So this means maybe a workshop, a retreat, or a, a class schedule, a ritual. You will learn how to structure your own offerings. So if you're interested in, in this workshop series, have a look on our website. So that's engaunite.com and you will find Teach Yoga in English workshop series it's starting next week and remember only until saturday so two days from today we've got a 25 percent discount so if you're interested take advantage of this um and if you have questions obviously let me know as well that's what i'm here for and I, I just wish, I hope that I'm, I can help help you to gain more confidence, teach more effectively and fill up your own classes, whether it's on Zoom or whether it's in a studio or whatever you're, wherever you're teaching. All right, 
I'm going to leave you here. I'm going to get the podcast. This podcast is going to be tomorrow on our podcast. So you can listen to it again and again. And I will see you tomorrow for the Q&A. Have a great day. Great rest of your day. And I will see you then. Bye.